Hello folks, um, nice to see you again, um, amongst these tumultuous times, uh, I think God has given me a message that I'm not going to go with our Hebrew study today. Um, many people are scared, many people are afraid and nervous and anxious and and things of that nature. I want to bring maybe a word of encouragement and hope for for you all as well as well you know what we need it too you know us preachers and pastors and you know need it. Um, Health care workers need it tremendously right now. Um, anybody that's working with the public close hand to hand and sometimes even as much as mouth to mouth because of the uh, of the problems <coughs> that are with us today. Um, one of those is, uh, you know, with all this hoarding and everything that's been going on, there's, uh, people are panicking. I still go to grocery stores. It's been two weeks, and now we're Indiana is under uh, shelter, shelter at home order for all of Indiana. All non-essential businesses will be closed. Uh, thank God for the ones that are open. Of course, those are the needed ones. Of course, uh, but uh, there's a lot of people who don't, and and even some of the the. I hate to say it, but maybe I don't. I don't know. Even the rich people are going to have some troubles, you know, because their jobs are closed down. Their jobs. Their jobs are closed down, too. Non-essential jobs. Someone can work from home. I'm at a job where I can't work from home right now. Uh, they're shutting down. I'm working, to be honest with you, I'm working my last day today. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an unsure thing right now, what's going on. Uh, people are worried about their finances. People are worried about their loved ones. People are worried about food and, and supplies and, and things of that nature. Uh, I just want to bring maybe a little bit of word of encouragement I don't know how many people actually listen to us. Um, I know Bible study is boring to a lot of people. You know, they, they feel like they can't uh, understand God's Word. God's Word is plainly written. I would say 90% of it is plainly written, and the rest of it is, is uh, um, allegory and symbolism. Uh, but it's all true. Every bit of it's true. And it's really plainly written for us to understand, whether you're in the King James Bible or New King James and um, those other versions that I don't approve of. They do hold to the, to the same thing, though, is that um, God's Word is true for the most part, unless you're reading something that's God-awful wrong. Um, I encourage you to make sure you get the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth by reading. Many people criticize the Bible. Many, many people criticize the Bible. Many people criticize there's no God. But you know what? Most of those, I would say 99.9% .9 of those that criticize the Bible, that criticize God and Jesus Christ, that He wasn't real, that He wasn't on this earth, never read the Bible completely and fully with open eyes. Not with your analytical brain, but with open eyes. To see how God really truly loves this world. He's always loved this world. Past, present, and future. We wouldn't be here. We're still here. And unfortunately there are some that have passed away. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because of the coronavirus. I have allergies. So that's why sometimes I have a cough. Uh, I don't, I'm not running a fever. I understand. Many people can run around and, and be healthy before they know they have the virus. We just saw um, 
a city official in Illinois said he didn't know he had it, but he has it now. He's under quarantine. So our prayers is that you stay firm in the word. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, first and foremost, please ask Jesus in your heart. Receive him into your heart. Follow his word. Do his word. And uh, do more than just Facebook or YouTube or Instagram or Snapchat or any of those others that are out there. It's so important that we understand God's word, especially in difficult times like this, when it's affecting the whole world. Uh, our prayer is that God and this word will be a blessing to you. I want to start in the book of Esther, chapter 4. Um, if anybody knows anything about the book of Esther, she was a queen chosen by Xerxes after he banished his old wife or killed his old wife. And he wanted a beauty contest of over 25,000 women from all over the place. And Queen Esther, well, she became queen. She won out all of, all of them. The problem was that she was a Jewish lady. Her uncle Mordecai was a Jewish man. And the Amalekites hated the Jews. This is the Medes and Romans, this is the Medes and Persians empire that we're reading about. And the thing is, once a king made a decree, it had to be carried out. And he himself could not even change this. Queen Esther finally in, in verse in chapter 4 agrees to go in front of the king which she could have lost her life she could have been beheaded at any moment uh, but she wasn't the Bible says that she was brought for a time like this to happen and I'm hoping those that love God's Word and those that are preaching God's Word are, are preaching God's truth you know full truth She was taught in the Word of God. Her uncle Mordecai was taught in the Word of God. We learn in chapter 4 that when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes. Haman, uh, one of the princes of the king's court, issued a decree to kill. He hated Mordecai. Haman did. And not only did he hate Mordecai, because of what Mordecai did not do was bow down and worship him or the king. He issued a decree. Uh, he had a decree made and had the king sign it. The king knew what the decree was. He signed it. And within a year, they were all going to be, you know, there was the, the uh, date was set for all the Jewish people to be killed by all the Amalekites and anybody else that was not a Jew that wanted to kill them. Uh, so they had a year. It took all, over almost a year for this to happen. Uh, he issued it in the first month of the year, and he said at the end of the last, uh, the last month, on the thirteenth day of that month, that uh, the Jews were going to be annihilated, not just not just killed, but annihilated. He wanted to kill all the Jews. That reminds us of what Hitler was like in the. Uh, 30s and the 40s of this past century. Um, so we're going to catch up with verse or chapter 4. I want to read uh, quite a bit. I want to talk about courage. It's going to take courage to get through this. It's going to take boldness to get through this. It's going to take not worrying about the consequences uh, to be a courageous person. Now, typically, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not as courageous as I ought to be or, or should be uh, at times, but there's other times that I have been very courageous, like protecting my wife, uh, protecting my child. But I'm being courageous today because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the Old Testament or the New Testament. I'm not ashamed at God's actions and decisions. I'm not ashamed of that, and I can boldly state that. And if I suffer repercussions for that, I, I don't care. I really don't because I'm in God's will in that way. And I pray to be in God's will all the time, even through this difficult time. 
And like I said, as of today, I'll be working one more day and then tomorrow starts our shutdown. Uh, so we worry about, you know, we, we all worry. I mean, the Bible says worry is a sin. We're all concerned. And so was Esther. So was Mordecai. Mordecai was concerned. M Mordecai was so concerned that he got, he had to talk to Esther and tell her, I can't do this job. You have to. A woman. A Jewish woman at that. And uh, it was it was your life on the line at this time. And there may be times that we have to have our life on the line and, some, in line, and sometimes we can't worry about the consequences. We just have to be bold and, and brave and courageous enough to do what God says to do in our hearts. And I shouldn't even say in our hearts, but in, in, the, in our spirits. Because the Bible says in, in, in Isaiah that our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know them? So I can't rely on my own feelings. This is a situation we can't rely on feelings with, brothers and sisters and friends. We have to rely on God. He's sovereign. He's Lord over all. He knows about this coronavirus. He is not surprised by it. No, he's not stopped it. Not yet. There may be a reason for him to. And I, keep, I, and I encourage you out there in the audience to examine your hearts. Examine your motives. Examine your lives. And, and, and please, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. I just want everybody to get rid of their sin and turn towards God. To reconcile with God. The Bible says that man is at war with God. Let us not be at war today. Like Haman wants to be at war with the Jews in, in the book of Esther. So let's read. There's three points I want to make about courage. And we're going to get into those. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried, and with a loud and bitter cry, he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. This is the attitude that God wants us to have, an attitude of humility. Uh, an attitude of awe to our God, of respect, of, I want to get rid of all my faults, I want to get rid of all my sins, I don't want anything that's in my life to get in the way of God's plan. I don't want, my, you know, my, our, our nation, here it's the Jewish people, I don't want our nation to suffer for my sins. I don't want the nation to suffer for anybody's sins. But we have such a corporate sin nature here in, in the U.S. alone, not counting the rest of the world. And, and, I, and the thing is, is God is wanting us to repent, to be humble to Him, to be, uh, to be respectful of Him, to worship Him, to honor Him. And that's what the Jews here are doing in chapter 4 here. So Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe, to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. He wasn't ready to accept the gift that God had for him yet because there were sins to repent from. There was a warning to give. This coronavirus is a warning to us. This, we often call this among, among the circles the pre-tribulation -pre time. This is a warning sign. It's like I think like 9-11 was 20 years ago, or 19 years ago. This is a warning sign. Things are going to happen. God's word is true. The prophecies have all been fulfilled up to the point of right now with, uh, with more to come. And they've been fulfilled with 100% accuracy. So he didn't accept them. Then Esther called... Uh, Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Why was Mordecai this way? So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the city and square that was in the front of the king's gate. And listen, 
And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay unto the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for, the, for their destruction, for the Jewish people's destruction, which was given at Shushan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he might command her, not yet command her, to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. So Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. She was in a position to do something about this. We're in a position, not only are we at a shelter at home order, but we're in a position to do something about this on our knees with God. And I'm going to be, being that I'm going to have time off, I'm going to be spending time in prayer along with all the other things I can do and need to do around the house and, and whatever the case may be. But then Esther spoke to Hathgak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death. Whoever comes before the king, put him to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter uh, to them. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in, in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, you, Mordecai was telling Queen Esther at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We've heard a lot of sermons about that verse. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews who are persistent, present in Shushan, <coughs> excuse, in Shushan and fast for me. Esther <coughs> didn't waste any time. She didn't waste any time. She says, Okay. I'm ready. And so for one of the first points that we want to make is that courage shows up. And Esther did that. She said, go gather, go gather all the Jews are that are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for these three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, she says, I'm going to perish. Courage makes a stand. She said, my people are more important than myself and my safety. And our American people are more important than just my safety, of me or my family. But we want to protect them all. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So Esther, Queen Esther there, had the courage to show up. She showed up. It took a formal letter for the king with reason why you want to see the king. Excuse me, my notes are sometimes a little weird because I'm not the best writer, but um, it's so important. Uh, and then the king had to write back with a formal invitation to come to the king. And then the royal scepter must be extended out to that person or to the queen and if it was extended to you by the king then you were allowed in the king's court courage never comes on sale or on discount it requires a cost courage shows up <coughs> knowing there is a cost I meant, um, I'm not real close friends with a pastor here, but I feel like that I am right now. Brother Jeff Spencer and his wife or, and his daughter um, are all sick, especially his wife, Darlene. Pray for them. But you know what Pastor Jeff did this past Sunday? He was still in the hospital, and he preached from his hospital bed. And oh, how he poured his heart out, heart out and loved the Lord so much. He, he tried so hard not to weep, but uh, it was okay if he did. 
please weep before God. Kneel before the Lord. And if you can't kneel because of your, of your uh, inabilities to, kneel in your heart. Kneel in your, in, your, in, your, in your mind and in your spirit and in your soul. Please, this is, this is so important. We want to see repentance. I, I would love to see abortion eliminated because of this. I would love to see uh, all the sins of the world eliminated because of this. Now, the world itself will not repent as a whole. But individuals can. Families can. Cities can. In the book of Jonah, Nineveh, uh, in the book of Jonah, Nineveh was ready to be destroyed. And he was a reluctant prophet, but he did what God told him to do. And he saved that, na that, that city from destruction for almost 250 to 400 years before God actually had to destroy it. Because that is the extent of God's patience. I mean, we can't even be patient enough with the guy in front of us who sits at the a light and maybe talking on his phone or, or is maybe whatever he's doing. I mean, in less than three seconds, we're honking our horns and saying, Get out of the way. I got somewhere to go. I got things to do. I got places to go. Look at the patience of God. People say that God endorsed genocide. He did not. If you look between the distance between God's warning, which he always gives everyone, he gives a warning first. And sometimes there's a great distance between the warning and the actual punishment or the destruction of people. The Bible says that God does not rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. That is not his modus operandi. His, 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 his motive is to see everybody saved. All souls saved. And Esther was here to see all the Jewish people saved. It took courage. It doesn't, it's not discounted. It's not a bargain with God. You don't bargain with God. You submit to His commands. You submit to His conditions. This is what God is wanting us to do. Is submit to the perfect will of God. Friends. As they would say a long time ago, Romans and countrymen, lend me your ear. This is so important for you to understand. God is not going to be patient sometime or another. He is giving warnings. He is, in a sense, if you want to say, he's throwing volley shots like a cannon. Not aiming to try to kill people, but give them a warning that your, your, your destruction could draw nigh. Your life could end at any moment, which is always the case. But now that this is, is here in the United States and all over the world, courage needs to show up. Courage for the Word of God. Courage for, you know, condemning sin. Not the sinner, but condemn the sin that is in this world that is in these United States, that's in our states, that is in our cities, that is in our families. And, some, and I would even say in our churches. We have to be careful. Sin needs to be conquered by people showing up courageous. Number two, courage stands up. Not only does it show up, you know, to try to call people's bluffs, but courage stands up. Courage says something. Courage does something. Courage encourages others. You ever hear that word encourage? That's what we're trying to do is to encourage, to poke, to push, to prod people to come to repentance in their lives. To seek the Lord's face, as First Chronicles says. To forsake our wicked ways. I know that I'm not perfect. So therefore, an imperfect person is trying to tell another imperfect person what to do because I have done it at times. And this is going to be and is another time that I'm confessing my sins and I'm going to repent and turn away from them. Not to turn back to them. 
courage stands up. So as we read in verse, chapter 5, Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. Now normally the Bible doesn't tell us to, to fast. <laughs> but because they fasted and cried and wept and sought God's face for three days, I believe that that was the reason that God allowed King Xerxes to give her the favor. Because he said, boom, off with your head. He could have said that. He was not. Most of these Mede and Persians kings were not very sane men. They considered themselves God, which is insane enough, because none of us on this earth is God. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court. See, she's standing. She showed up. She's standing in the court that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out his, his golden scepter. that was in his hand, then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given unto you, even to the half of my kingdom. And if that was a large kingdom back then. So Esther answered, If it pleases the king, let the king and Haman, the guy, the wicked guy that made the king sign this, came today to the banquet that have prepared for him. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, God has given us a banquet for many, many years. America is still one of the richest, if not the richest nation in the world. And we've been sitting at his banquet table for all these years, all these hours and months and weeks and decades. We've been sitting at the banquet of God. And we've filled ourselves and we've gorged ourselves and, and we've, we've uh, hoarded things to ourselves. So he said, she said, the king then said in verse 5 of chapter 5, Bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. At the banquet of wine, at the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, "What is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half the kingdom, it shall be done." Then Esther answered and said, "My petition and request is this: that if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king has said." So she prepared another banquet after the first banquet. So she comes before the king. She showed up. She showed up the king's palace. She stood up. We as people must stand up to this world of sin and degradation. The world of pleasure. The world's kind of pleasure. Not God's kind of pleasure. God is not a boring God. God is not a, uh, a vengeful God to us if we are children of His. He is vengeful to Satan and the sin of the world that's been uh, uh, attributed to many lost people that don't know Jesus, that don't know the Father. So, Haman, and I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to read all this because it's, it's a lot to read. I want you to read the whole book of Esther. It's nine, ten chapters. It's not that long. You can read it in 15, 20 minutes. But I don't want you to just read it in 15, 20 minutes. I want you to understand it and chew on it and work on it. Courage, courage stands up, brothers and sisters. It doesn't sit down. It doesn't sit out. There's no time to think about the actions or the words. Her time of thinking was the fasting and the praying and the weeping and, and the mourning for her people. We need to ask ourselves this question, spiritually and probably even physically. Are we bleeding red or are we bleeding yellow? Are we cowards 
I mean, I, I admit there's times I've been coward. I've a coward in my life. And you would have swore there would have been yellow blood coming out of me. But not now. Not this time. Not at this moment. It's so important that we understand that. Do what is the right thing to do, no matter what. Do it. Courage asks, what is the right thing to do? It doesn't take courage to do the wrong thing. It doesn't. It takes a coward to do the wrong thing. Every time we sin, we're a coward against God. Every time we, we want to do things our way, it's, it's, it's being cowardice toward God. Because we don't want to face up to the truth. We don't want to obey the truth, which is better for us. Which is stronger for us. Standing up in courage, standing up for what is right is not trendy. Standing for what is right, it's not always popular. And I'd say most of the time it's not popular. Because this world doesn't want to do right. But we as children of God can. Again, if you're not a child of God, you're a creation of God and God loves you. But if you're not a child of God, I don't care what, what, what religion you're from or no religion. If, you don't, if, you, if you're not a child of God, you, you are asking for His hand to come against you. Fear will scream in your ears, do nothing. Don't just not do nothing, do something. There's many brave men and women and even children that are doing something great for this kingdom of God and for this time such as this. We're seeing manufacturers changing their production like they did in World War II to, to help America win World War II. Now we're trying to win the coronavirus war. And they're changing. And some places that were making alcohol are making an, uh, uh, hand sanitizer and antiseptics for the thousands and thousands of hospitals and hospital workers and patients. There's some that are taking their, their manufacturing from making a car or whatever and making masks and, and ventilators and things like that. Praise God for that. But I think our greatest production, the greatest thing that we can do is to repent and to confess and weep and mourn for our nation and for ourselves if we have to. For not listening to God, not obeying God, not doing His will. He created us. That's what He created us for. To worship Him, to bless Him. He, he's not... And, I, and at times I often thought, well, God, you're an awfully proud God. God, you're an awfully selfish God because you want all the praise and glory and honor. But when you look at it, when you look at it, he can snuff you out in a heartbeat. But because of his love for his creation, he hasn't. You're still here. As long as you have breath to breathe, you have the opportunity to turn unto him who is the author and the finisher of my faith, and can be your faith as well. Courage doesn't, doesn't do nothing. I mean, courage, our fear, says do nothing. Fear says say nothing. Fear says sit down and shut up. Courage is the mastery of fear. Not that we don't have fear, but it masters fear. Courage is to, to be willing to do what God wants you to do, not knowing what the consequences are beforehand. Well, if I do this, what will happen? You know what? Sometimes we just can't worry about that. I know right is right and wrong is wrong. God does not like ugly. At the same time, God has not made a mistake in creating you and me. The last thing I want to say is that Courage speaks up. Courage shows up. Sure, courage stands up. And courage speaks up. And that's what I am doing today. Courage speaks up. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, we read this. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king again said to Esther, What is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Again, up to the half of the kingdom, it shall be done. 
Then he says, Then Queen Esther answered and said this, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me of my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold by we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female male and female slaves, I would have not said or held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. So <coughs> the king answered and said to Queen Esther, Who is he? When is uh, where is he? Why would who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is the wicked Haman, sitting there right there in the banquet hall with him. So Haman was terrified before the queen. And he was so terrified, listen to this, And the king rose in, the, in his wrath from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. When the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was. Then the king said, Will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? Not only basically came in, Haman fainted, and most evil people do, I don't know if he fainted or if he was across Esther's lap, but the king thought uh, thought that he was uh, trying to do something to Queen Esther, and he wasn't having it. As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now, Herabona, one of the eunuchs, said to the king, Look, the gallows, the gallows that he built for Mordecai in the previous chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, was meant for Mordecai. Oh, by the way, Mordecai, guess what? Got the praise. And Haman had to lead him around and say, Hail, King, hail Mordecai. For the king has found favor in his sight. For he saved the king's life. You can read that in the book of Esther, the rest of it. And then, look the gallows, 50 cubits feet high, which Haman made. For Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subsided. Chapter 8 goes on to say that G Esther saved the Jews. Here's another thing if you read on. As you read on, guess what happened? The king, the king did not take the decree, decree away for them to be annihilated. What he did is create a new decree and gave them weapons by the, by the asking of Esther to defend themselves. Over 74,000 Medes and Persians died that day, that day that was set for annihilation of the Jewish people. 75,000 were killed. Now, here's the thing. 75,000 people were warned for a whole year. Don't do this. I believe Mordecai went around the whole kingdom and went to the provinces and was telling people, don't do this. You, you, you're going you're gonna to be destroyed. I don't want you to be destroyed, but I don't want the Jews to be destroyed either. They had this time. And you know what? We as America has had our time too since 9-11 and probably other times too. There, if we do not listen to the word of the Lord, if we do not obey the word of the Lord, if we do not stand up, if we do not show up or stand up or speak up for the word of God, our destruction is upon ourselves. Our destruction of this nation will be upon ourselves. Yes, I know there is a story of Abraham asking God to save Sodom and Gomorrah if there was only down to five righteous people. God said he would. I mean, you listen, there's there's many righteous people here in the United States. I can I, I can attest to a few of them. But the idea is all of us repent. All of us turn back to God. His 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 idea for us is not to destroy us. 
but to reconcile us unto himself once again. To get ourselves out of the curse of sin and death and hell and the grave. I encourage you, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, and my enemies, if I have any, which I'm sure that I do, my, my reason for preaching today is not for me, it's for you. It's for you, because God loves you so much. And God gave me, when I was 16 years old, the, the, the call to preach, and I've, uh, I've been preaching for a lot of years. But I've never experienced this, and most of America has never experienced anything like a pandemic like this today. May your hearts be right. May your love be true, because God loves us in truth and in love. And we love you. Father God, we give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name for your work that is about to be done. Amen. Thank you.